Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, obviously, the course here is uh, when disastrous events happen in your building and uh, how they should be handled. So there's the, uh, the key part to that. My name is Greg Robson. I am the branch manager from Dorisco and the large loss specialist. Um, I travel all over Canada to do handle large multi-unit residential floods, fires, um, commercial buildings, industrial buildings. Probably the largest one I did was uh, the Green Giant factory in Windsor. So it was about a $50 million fire that happened there. So um, just some housekeeping notes that I'm supposed to remind you of. Um, if you have mobile phones, uh, they ask you to please put them on silent. So if you can do that, that would be great. Um, so first of all, how many of you have had something like this happen in one of your buildings? All right. It's never a fun time, is it? <laughs> um, so this is what happens probably when you get the phone call. This is what you're doing because, of course, floods and fires never seem to happen during normal business hours. One of the upsides or downsides of our job, I guess, you constantly get woken up for it. When you've had this happen, how many of you were completely satisfied with how the process was handled? Look at that. Nobody. <laughs> um, how many of you would like to see, what would be the biggest thing I guess you would like to see handled differently if you had to go around the room? Michelle? Thanks for putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just think in, in, in emergency situations, it always seems that there's never a proper process in place. So just a more direct kind of uh, full complement of what uh, should happen. Okay. So communication yeah, is that one thing. Good. So does everybody pretty much agree that communication is always a, you as the building and property managers are probably the last one to know what's actually going on. Restoration companies tend to come in and they take over and you're in the background going like, hello, this is my building, what's happening? So that's one of the things that is a key factor is communication. You should be notified all the time. I mean, there's always the age old adage that after your contractor starts the job, where do they go halfway through the job? It shouldn't be like that. You shouldn't have to chase people down to get updates. You should be, especially during the emergency service stage, you should be getting updated at least daily as to what's happening, where we're going, and so on and so forth. So when you get there after you had a flood, this is usually after hours, what you're met with when you get to your building if you don't happen to live on site. You go there and you have a whole bunch of tenants, contractors, people, basically looking for information that you don't necessarily have the answers to at this particular time. They haven't even given you a chance to digest what's going on or seen the loss yourself, but yet you have people doing that. So you have tenants that have been directly affected by the flood or fire that are currently displaced out of their house. And you have the tenants that just want to go back to sleep that haven't been affected by it. And they're like, why do you have to make so much noise? So the f this is basically, kind of a worst case scenario, but you have an apartment building here with uh, some pretty heavy water damage. It's sat for a while. But the first thing that should be done after you get the call is you should be calling your restoration company. That should be your very first call. Um, not necessarily to your insurance provider or other people. I mean, you should be calling somebody out, whoever provides your emergency services first. Time is of the essence. So the faster they arrive, the less damage that's going to occur. The other thing that I wanted to mention as well is that you can choose your own contractor. A lot of insurance companies are going to say, well, we have a preferred vendor. ABC contractor is not our preferred vendor. You as the property owner slash manager have the choice to choose whichever vendor you want. Much like your house, you can't have somebody force you to use a contractor that you don't know or don't trust in your house. You have to allow their contractor in your building to look at it, but you don't necessarily have to allow them to do the job. If you're, if you're happy with ABC restoration and that's who you want to do the job, that's your right to choose them. So when a restoration company arrives, obviously the first thing that we need to do, as you were mentioning, is a site assessment. We have to walk in at the very beginning of the job, look around, assess the damage, and sort of come up with a game plan. Um, the assessment, obviously we're going to talk mostly about floods, a little bit about fires, but you're quite 
more likely to be affected by a flood than you are a fire. Um, the first thing that's going to happen is we've got to assess the category and the class of the water loss. So um, I'll go a little bit more into the categories down the road. Um, the other thing we have to determine is what can be dried, what can't be dried. That's a big thing. So unfortunately, a lot of restoration companies these days are tear out contractors. And I'm sure you've all been to floods where somebody's hot water tank is ruptured or somebody's left a tub on or something like that. And you come back and all the drywall's been cut out, all the insulation, the flooring, everything's been removed, right? That doesn't need to happen. Um, most of them can be dried. So there's a category two loss, which would be a gray water loss. Almost all of those can be dried and every category one loss should be able to be dried. There is a few extenuating circumstances that go on from time to time, depending on what the building materials are made up and stuff like that. And that comes from the site assessment when we walk through to look at it. But if you've had a clean water loss, chances are you should be able to dry it. So after that, uh, we have to assess the safety of the building for your residents, the people walking through, the contractors. Safety is a big, big thing from when it comes to losses, especially fire losses where you have structural integrity issues. After that, we can begin the mitigation. So what is mitigation? Does everybody here know pretty much what mitigation is? Anybody have any questions with that? So I'll go over it real quick for you. Mitigation is the act of mitigating or lessening the force or intensity of something that's unpleasant in your buildings. Uh, the act of making the conditions or consequences less severe and the process of becoming mild, gentler, or less severe. So a mitigating circumstance, event, or consequence. So what should happen when we walk in is the order of services after a flood has happened. So the first thing that needs to happen is we need to remove all the standing water. That is of the utmost importance, is to get rid of the standing water. So there's a couple different ways, and I'll show a few pictures up here that you've probably been able to see. First thing you can do is a portable extractor. So you've probably all seen these. Look something similar to this. There's different colors, models, stuff like that, but that's pretty much the gist of it. You're going to have a truck-mounted extractor which a lot of people will use on um, lower rise buildings. They're not really effective on super high rise buildings, but look something like that. Somebody will pull up with a van, carpet cleaning trucks and stuff like that. We call them truck mounted extractors. And then the last one is a pump. So a trash pump, people use a gas pump, electric pump, something similar to this, depending on the quantity of water that we can use for that. When you're removing water from carpet, carpet and pad, we're gonna talk a little bit about here is uh, probably the best way you can do it is something called an extreme extractor. So it looks like this. What it is, it's an electric ride-on material or ride-on machine. So the gentlemen actually stand on those two spots right there and they ride around. It's a little bit of a slow process, but this will remove somewhere in the neighborhood of about 96% of the water from carpet and pad. That makes it extremely easy to dry when there's only 4% water left. So obviously that number depends on your type of carpet, whether it's um, a Berber or a Saxony carpet, that kind of thing. But most of the water will be removed. This is the most effective way to remove water from carpet. The next method is a water claw. So I don't know, you, some of you may have seen this. I'll show a picture of it there. So it looks like that. So basically the hose gets hooked up right there at the end and uh, I don't have a laser pointer here, maybe, maybe that works. Oh. Yeah, you can't see it. Anyways, the extractor hose will get hooked up to it and then somebody stands on it. They clean that one little section of area underneath of it and they pick it up, move forward, stand on it. So it is a little bit slow as well. This is a fairly effective method as well. It'll remove somewhere in the neighborhood of about 86% of the water. Not quite as good as the extreme extractor, but still removes a lot of water. The next one is a light wand, which you've probably all seen. We use for carpet cleaning and stuff like that. Looks like that. How many of you have seen them when you have floods? They're extracting water using this. One person, everybody else. <laughs> so this, believe it or not, will only remove about 7% of the water on carpet and pad. It is extremely ineffective when you have carpet and pad. If you have glue down carpet or commercial carpet, it works fairly decent on that. But when you have a residential situation with carpet and pad, it does not compress the pad and therefore most of the water will stay. So when you're trying to dry 93% of the water out of this carpet with air movers and dehumidifiers, it's gonna take you a very, very long time. 
Carpet is the easiest thing to dry. If your restoration or emergency service provider cannot dry carpet, you really need to consider who you have as an emergency service provider. Because if they can't dry carpet, they can't dry anything. Carpet is nylon, it's very, very easy to dry. Removal water. So category three water, or black water, which comes from a sewer backup, obviously that we cannot dry. Sorry about that. We cannot dry that, that has to be removed. With that being said, when you do remove it, when you suck it up either with a pump or an extractor or something along those lines, where you're disposing of the water is extremely important. You wouldn't just take sewage and dump it out in your parking lot. Well, unfortunately, a lot of companies do that. They're gonna extract, extract from a sewer backup and then they're gonna go find a storm drain, they're gonna find something else, they're gonna open up their <coughs> truck mount, they're just gonna dump it into your parking lot down the storm drain. If the Ministry of Environment catches you doing that, they will issue fines to either the contractor that's doing it and possibly the people that are hiring that contractor as well. It has to be disposed of, disposed of down a sanitary drain, just like every other sewer. So whether or not they call in a truck to actually extract it, take it away and dispose of it properly, you take it to an RV dump, something along those lines, but to just extract it and pump it out, throw it in your parking lot, it is technically against the law. The other thing that happens is building security. So I'm sure as a lot of you are aware, like you were mentioning, that there's a lot of chaos after a loss happens. Building security is of the paramount. It is very, very important. I mean, if you're dealing with multi-unit residential buildings, you have all the tenants' belongings in there. A lot of times the building has been evacuated or a portion of the building has been evacuated. You have to make sure that people's stuff is safe and the building is safe. You're not gonna get people wandering in and around. So we need security for that. Um, the other thing security is good for is fire watch. How many of you had your buildings on fire watch at one point or another? All right, so you're well aware of that. So when it is for the people who haven't had that, whenever your fire control system or your fire alarm panel is offline, your building has to be on fire watch, even if it's vacant. Why, I have no idea, but if the building is vacant, the fire department requires if the fire alarm is down, you have to have a security guard or somebody on site completing fire watch every hour until the fire alarm control panel is back up and running. That can get expensive fairly quickly. So um, for mitigation, obviously when we're going into some of the losses and stuff like that, the cheaper way to do your loss and the fastest way to get it, your building back together is to mitigate it as opposed to doing tarot like I had mentioned before. So one of the things that it'll do is it'll reduce your loss ratios. Now a loss ratio is, um, an insurance term when it comes down to it. it's basically how much premium they collect versus how much they have to pay in claims. When you own a large number of buildings or you manage a large number of buildings, much like WSIB, the less claims you have, the cheaper your insurance premiums are gonna be. So if you have more claims, your insurance goes up, vice versa. Insurance companies typically are not in the business of losing money. So what it does is it reduces a reduction in your overall repair costs because we're drying stuff out um, it'll redu redu uh, excuse me. It'll reduction or disruption in your day-to-day -day activities. If we're only in there doing the mitigation for a week versus tearing everything out and have being in there for two, three months fixing everything, it's less disruption for you. For your tenants, it's a uh, reduction in additional living expenses, or if you're putting your tenants up elsewhere, it's a reduction from you having to pay for additional living expenses. Some building owners do, some building owners don't. Business interruption costs, that's another one that's really big on. And this one is lost clientele. Fairly important, I mean, you don't want to, everybody likes having your buildings occupied. If you displace them for a month, two months, three months, they may just find a different place to go and live and now you have to re-rent that apartment. Sometimes that's good, depending on your tenant. It also closes your claim a little faster, so. Um, Examples of types of losses that can benefit from mitigation. First one is fires, obviously. Um, water losses is another one that we had just spoke, briefly spoke upon. Wind is another really, uh, one that you can benefit from mitigation as well. And odor. How many of you had apartments that tend to stink a little bit? You have to go in and treat it or do something on your unit turn to make it so you can rent it again. So smoke is uh, 
a big thing. So what it is, do you know exactly what smoke is, where it comes from? No? Smoke is basically unburnt fuel. That's what causes it. So when you look at a furnace that's 98% efficient and stuff like that, you don't see a lot of smoke coming out of the, the chimney from a furnace because the fuel is being burned at a very high um, efficiency. Whereas if you have soot or smoke in a fire, what it does is it's partially burnt stuff. So you still have hydrocarbons in it and stuff like that. So this is uh, smoke from a wood burning fire. So you can see a little bit different than your furnace. It's coming out, it's kind of grayish in color. This is a full house fire. You notice the difference in the colors, drastically different because in your house fire now you have your asphalt shingles that are burning, you have your plastics within the house, you have uh, the nylon in the carpet, all kinds of stuff like that. So the soot's gonna be a lot blacker, it's gonna be a more heavy residue. Um, I'm not gonna go through and read this whole thing for you. Basically what it does is it's, soot is an acid. So from a corrosion mitigation standpoint, the longer you let soot sit on stuff, the less chance you're gonna be able to recover that. So when you have vinyl windows on a wind, um, in a house and you've had a house fire, your restoration provider should be going in right away and doing mitigation corrosion or corrosion mitigation on that. It doesn't necessarily have to be clean, but they have to neutralize the acid. So one way you can do is you can go and test the acidity of it and then you find a base that balances it back out and you bring it back down. So it still may be streaky, but it's not actually going to stain your windows. So you may remember, or you may have seen when you go in after everything's clean, the white vinyl on windows will actually be yellow. That is the acid in soot that is damaging the window. Once it goes like that, you cannot save it. So a simple little thing like going in and doing corrosion mitigation um, could save your claim thousands and thousands of dollars and a lot of lead time. Now you don't need to order windows, right? If the window's not broken and you just wipe down right away, neutralize the acid, you can chances, chances are you can save that window. Soot will also pressurize a building and travel with it. So newer buildings have what's uh, fire stops and fire control measures, measures to prevent soot from traveling throughout a building. So you can see here where your pipes go up, you got your electrical chases and your plumbing pipes and stuff like that. On older buildings that don't have fire stops, that just becomes a chimney for soot. So you may have a fire in a third floor of a building that's eight stories high. Chances are that soot, if it's gotten into the walls and there isn't fire stops, it'll actually travel right through all the way up in the fire chases. So just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. It could be in there. So how can soot damage items? We touched on that a little bit ahead of time. It was, um, it's an acid, so it etches stuff. Um, it's a combination usually of hydrochloric acid and hydrobromic acid. So uh, usually comes from high temperature fires where you have things that aren't burning properly. The other thing we can do, I don't know if we have internet on this. Do you know if there's internet on this computer? You're not sure? I have a video here for laser ablation, but it doesn't appear to be popping up. So we have a new technique um, that we can use to remove soot. It's called laser ablation. If you want after the show, if you give me your card, I can email you the information on it or email you the link. Um, what it does is we can remove soot 100% with a laser and not have any fallout. The nice thing about this, the, the most advantageous part from a building restoration science standpoint, is how many of you have had a fire, a very large fire in a building? All right. How many have had it burn through the window or door outside so you have a soot plume on the outside of your building? Did your insurance company pay to clean the entire side of the building? Did they? The area, that's right, just the area that's affected. Your insurance policy typically will read that they're not responsible for matching and color matching and all that kind of stuff. So traditional cleaning methods will work in removing soot from a building, but what it does is it also removes the patina off of the building. So if you have a building that's 30 or 40 years old, you're gonna have the natural weathering of the building on the outside of that building. So when you use traditional cleaning methods, it goes back down to new. So now you're left with a clean spot and the rest of your building with 30 or 40 years of patina on it. As a building owner, you're gonna like, excuse me, I want the whole thing cleaned. Your insurance company most of the time is gonna go, no, that's not how your policy works. I'm not cleaning the side of this 35-story apartment building. 
With laser, what we can do is we can actually tune the laser and we can remove the soot and leave the patina to actually make your building look exactly the way it did pre-loss. So it's actually very tunable. Um, they tell us you can actually spray paint the Mona Lisa and we can remove the spray paint, leave the Mona Lisa untouched. That's how tunable it is. They're probably not going to let us spray paint the Mona Lisa. but Corrosion mitigation. Um, it's the ability to save corrosion within a structure. We had touched on that a little bit with saving your windows, your faucets. Um, any item that's metal or glass is one of the first things that's going to start to corrode. Plastic, other items, I mean, there's certain things you can't save from soot. I mean, if you have carpet that's gotten on fire or heavily soot damaged, you're not going to salvage that. Um, if it's a pressure fire, which means smoke's gotten inside the drywall cavities, you're not going to be able to save that. But some of the, the fixtures on top of that, you can. Windows, glass, and vinyl are one of the things that'll benefit from um, corrosion mitigation. Doors and door hardwares, depending on what your door is manufactured out of. Plumbing fixtures. So sometimes you just have a little inexpensive $40 uh, Moen faucet in your kitchen. Sometimes it's a, an expensive building and you may have a three, $400 faucet. So again, running a cloth and neutralizing the acid on your faucets will save that substantially. Shower doors and glass. Glass will etch and become translucent as opposed to transparent. Cabinet poles. Sometimes they're inexpensive. Sometimes, depending on the value of your apartment and the clientele, sometimes you have very expensive cabinet poles. And contents. Contents is another really big one that uh, we can salvage from contents. So um, restoration companies have systems like Fireline and Esporta, things like that. Surprisingly enough, we can clean a lot of stuff that most people don't think can be cleaned. You have a large screen TV, something like that. We can actually take it apart, pressure wash it. Yes, I said pressure wash it, electronic television. Unplug it, pressure wash it, clean it, dry it, put it back together. It'll be as clean as it was the day you got it or cleaner. And it'll work perfectly fine. So, Light fixtures and chandeliers, that's always a big one that causes uh, a little bit of anxiety with some people because your $30 fixture after a fire becomes a $2,500 fixture. Tile, ceramic tile. Sometimes, um, depending on it, it can be cleaned as well, depending on what happened, whether it's a pressure fire or not, and depends on how much restoration it's going to cost. I mean, we always weigh, is it worth cleaning? Like, if it's going to cost me $100 to clean something that only costs $50 to repair, a repair is a better option but sometimes you have other extenuating circumstances. So any other plastics, wood, um, or sorry, plastics, metal, or glass within the house we can clean. So the first thing we do when we walk in or a restoration contract should do, which may seem kind of odd, is they'll ask for a piece of tissue paper or a paper towel or something like that. When you're examining how much soot is within a building is we'll take a piece of toilet paper and we'll walk through and they'll touch glass and plastic and metal because you may not see soot on the wall because if it spreads evenly, you're like, okay, maybe it's a little dirty, no big deal. But if you take toilet paper and you run it across a window, uh, window or a chandelier, piece of glass, something like that, metal, soot will attract to cold things first. So have you been into a building after a fire? How many have? You notice that you can see every single drywall screw on the building? That's because the screws are colder than the rest of the drywall. So the soot will attract to the cold. It does the same thing with metal. So that's how we tell how much penetration has usually gone through the building is you wipe toilet paper on it. If there's black on the toilet paper, you know that there's soot on it. Wind, um, you get some high velocity wind losses, obviously that can remove shingles, um, tear apart roofs, stuff like that. So mitigating on these things is basically just covering up the openings. Uh, making sure that you're not going to get any more rain damage inside your building or snow damage, excuse me, etc. cetera. Uh, flat roofs, they can be uh, fairly expensive to repair. You get a really heavy wind damage and it'll actually peel the roof right off or open up a roof. We've done apartment buildings in the past that have pulled the entire roof structure off of the top of a third story room. So you have to reframe that as a temporary, put roofing uh, up, keep it waterproof. Odor, there's another big one. Um, whether it's a skunk, it's cooking spices, it's um, cat and dog urine, odor is usually a big thing. 
So with odor, you have um, two different ways you can get rid of odor. You use a masking agent or you can use a pairing agent. Almost every single air freshener you're ever going to see, regardless of what Febreze commercials tell you, is a masking agent. All it's doing is replacing an unpleasant odor with a more powerful pleasant odor. You're basically hiding it. What a pairing agent does is it'll actually, like the Febreze commercial shows you, it'll encapsulate the odor and dissolve it. The best way to do that is through oxidation. You just oxidize the odor or rust the odor is the best way. So I mean, you can take things out into the sun, for instance, leave, it, leave something out in the sun for a couple weeks, it will eventually oxidize that odor and return it back to odor neutral. Obviously inside buildings or with certain items, that's not always an option. There is other methods, we can use hydroxyl, ozone, biosweep. There's numerous uh, ways we can actually treat odor to get rid of it. So um, curry is a big smell that sometimes tends to cause apartments to become unrentable. And a lot of property managers will actually completely paint the unit, tear the carpet out, do all kinds of stuff with curry. In most cases, we can have that treated within eight to 10 hours. And other than visually affecting, we can make it come back to odor neutral fairly quickly and make that unit turn a lot faster for you and cheaper. Water losses, um, it's the most common form. So your property is roughly 30 times more likely to flood than it is to catch on fire. Um, usually not as much money in claims when it comes down to it. Fires are typically more destructive and cost more money, but they don't happen near as often. Structural drying, um, which I'll get into in a minute, is it's come a long way in the last 30 years, 40 years since we restoration companies have been around. So what is in place drying? We apply proven methods to actually dry building materials. Uh, the use of proper equipment is extremely important. Improper equipment, A, does nothing, or you're consuming a lot of electricity without actually getting anywhere. Monitoring the structure is very important to make sure that it actually is drying and having trained staff. And like I said, it removes little or no building material. If it's dried properly, you can get away. There's a couple of seats up here, if you want to come. <laughs> you can, uh, most times you can get away and you can dry the structure and remove very next to nothing. So it reduces your claim cost when we in place dry. Your emergency service bill will be more than traditional emergency services with tear out, but it, uh, the overall cost of the claim goes down substantially. Redux, reduction in your cycle time which is important, the faster you can get your tenants back in or you get your building back to use and don't have to see us, I'm sure you'll be happy. Um, reduction in repair, um, repair requirements, so less mess, less drywall mess. I mean, when you've had drywall repairs in a house that you're living in, drywall dust tends to go everywhere. And documentation, you should be given all documentation. After a building's dry, your restoration contractor should provide you with all documentation to show you that it is dry. And if you're not sure how to interpret those readings, ask, they should explain it to you. Because if you have a tenant come up to you or you end up going to the landlord tenant review because something's, oh, echo. <laughs> <laughs> or you end up going to the landlord tenant review, um, you have documentation to prove that you've actually dried it as opposed to saying, I don't know, the guy said it was dry. You should be given this documentation. Here's a couple photos of what in-place drying looks like. So the photo on your left, um, what we're doing is tenting a floor and pumping in some heat and some air movement and dry air to dry the hardwood floor. And on the right, same thing, but it's mostly being focused under the cabinets as well. So you can dry underneath cabinets. You have to remove the toe kick to get under the cabinets, but it's all about directing your airflow and directing your dry air. Wet will go to dry. That's a lot of things that a lot of people don't seem to believe, but if it can get wet, you can dry it. You just have to know how to manipulate the air environment to get to that happen. When we use in-place drying, um, can we use it and should we use it? Like I said, if it's gonna cost more money to dry it as opposed to tear it out, sometimes a tear out's a more or applicable option but sometimes you want your building back faster. Most times in place drying is a better option. 
So these are your categories of water. So you probably heard them up growing up as clean water, gray water, black water. Uh, we refer to them as category one, two, and three. So like I said, almost all category one losses can be dried. Almost all category two losses can be dried. And no category three losses can be dried. Sometimes companies will want us to dry category three. It is highly recomm unrecommended. So, and by black water, I'm just gonna touch on this a little bit. It doesn't have to be black. That's the big thing that a lot of people look at it. I mean, we've gone to numerous sewer backups where the water's clear. And they're like, well, you can just dry that. It's clear water. You can't see pathogens. You can't see bacteria. It's all in the water. If you wouldn't drink it, you shouldn't dry it. So, I mean, that's what I always tell people. Are you comfortable enough to reach down and grab a cup of that and drink it? No? Well, you shouldn't be drying it. The other thing is that there's a really common mistake made on sewer backups is air movement. Bacteria and stuff that's within uh, category three water is currently waterborne. It is not airborne. The only equipment that should be on after you've done removed all your building materials that are affected is an air scrubber and a dehumidifier. There should be no fans inside the building at that time because your category three water, if you're drying it with high velocity air movers, you're aerosolizing those bacteria now especially if you have immune compromised people with children or old age people or something like that, there's the potential they could breathe in some harmful bacteria. You should never have air movement on a category three water loss. Um, who defines these? I'm not gonna go over them all, a whole bunch. Um, the IRCRC is S500. That is the guide that we follow for water damage. Um, pretty much every restoration company should be following these guidelines. Um, they're the ones that come up with the definitions, the categories, the tech, the science that involves how to dry stuff. Technology. So we probably all used to have the device on the left at some point or another, and have slowly gravitated to the one on the right. And if you see somebody with a phone in the middle today, secretly inside, I know you're judging them because they don't have a smartphone, right? Drying equipment is the same way. It's come a long way, a long, long way. Um, you know, it, people started out with what they call carpet dryers. They look like a little snail for the fans. They still sell those today, but they're, they draw really high amps and they have very limited airflow. Um, axial air movers are a little bit better. They're going to dry, you know, about 3,000 cubic feet and take half the amps that the snail dryers do. So about three times the airflow. The dehumidifiers used to be big, bulky metal refrigerant ones that are no different than the one you can go buy at Canadian Tire. In most cases, they're not as good as the one that you can buy at Canadian Tire. So there's a picture of what they look like. So the one on the left, seriously, if you have any of your contractors are still using this, you need to stop using them. <laughs> that is, that's about 25 years old. It draws eight amps and it'll only move 50 pints of water a day. It's really not that efficient. Um, there's no bypass, it doesn't pump. They still usually have to put it on top of a bucket of water to let drain out into that. The middle one, a um, little bit better. They're still in use today, but not near as popular. Um, draws a little bit less amps, removes a little bit more water. Um, has some bypass technology. It's not a low grain refrigerant, which means um, if the area in the room is colder than 68 degrees Fahrenheit, most of the time you're just burning electricity. It's not going to remove a lot of water for you. And the one on the right, um, that's what we call an extra, extra large dehumidifier. So it draws pretty high amps still, but it'll remove over three times the water the one on the left does. That's bypass technology, so it'll work when it's cold, it'll work when it's hot. It, uh, it works, it removes a lot of water. 161 pints in a day is a boatload of water that it's taken out. And how many of you said have you, you've had a really bad flood in your buildings? Like multi-unit residential, really bad flood? Did they use one of these? No. This is a desk and dehumidifier. This is the Cadillac of dehumidifiers. When you have a very bad flood, they're expensive to operate, they're expensive to rent, but there is nothing that will dry a building like a desk and dehumidifier. They're not applicable in all situations. So again, if you have a 40-story building on the 38th story, if you have a flood, bringing this up and piping air up into it because it is on a trailer, 
maybe might, might not be the best method to do that, so you might have to use portable desk and dehumidifiers and such. But when you have a building that's less than 10 stories and you've had flood all the way down, if your restoration contractor is not using this, they do not know how to dry. Because using portables is just not as effective as using a desk again. Like this one will remove 3,000 pints a day versus that other one that was the Cadillac of the smaller portables is 161. So uses a lot of power, it's loud, there's generators that go around with it, there's usually people not occupying in it, but it is very, very dry. Works when it's cold, it prefers cold air. Here's some drying equipment, some air movers that we have. So on the left you have the old carpet dryer snails. Those are the high velocity, or uh, not real high velocities, but a thousand cubic feet a minute is what they're gonna push. Um, they do have very high static pressure, which means they can pressurize a cavity very, very well, but they draw a lot of amps. You're only gonna get two of these on a 15 amp circuit. You're not gonna get three or four. The middle one is the axial air mover. Uh, you're going to get about five of these on one 15 amp circuit and each one is going to do three times the airflow that one of the snails does or we call them snails but carpet dryers and then the newest one that they just came out with is a radio air mover um, doesn't have a lot of um, cubic feet per minute pressure wise yeah. so do you use the air movers with a dehumidifier with a dehumidifier yes yeah so Touching on that a little bit, you've probably noticed uh, most restoration companies will go in and they'll set air movers up on the outside of the wall and they put a dehumidifier in the middle. So what we want is you want the airflow in a vortex, it's got to be circular, and then your dehumidifier is in the middle. If you put an air mover pointing at a dehumidifier, it's going to cause your dehumidifier to freeze and be ineffective. It'll be in defrost all the time. You don't want airflow across your dehumidifier. Um, that is how most floods should be set up. So in this room in particular, I don't know, we're probably 30 by 40 feet in this room. You're probably going to have, I don't know, maybe 15 air movers in this room to be drying properly. A lot of people walk in and they're like, holy, that's a lot of equipment. But to dry it properly, you need a lot of equipment. So it's How one air mover. How long will it take to dry this? Room? Anywhere from three to five days. Yeah. Yeah. No, three to five days. Running 24-7, yeah. So if you turn the equipment off, then obviously it's gonna take longer. So some people wanna watch TV or have dinner and they turn the equipment off on you. I mean, they have hour meters on them. Most equipment has hour meters on them and you'll check the hour meters to find out if your tenants are turning them off. So when you go back after four days and it's not dry, it's, you know, it's only run three hours because the second we walk out of the room, they go click <laughs> and turn it off, right? I mean, it's ineffective at that point, but that's beyond our control. Um, heat drying and vapor pressure. So this is a little bit into the science. I'm not going to delve into this too, too much. Um, everything dries with heat. Everything. I mean, you dry your hair in the morning, for the ladies, maybe some of the guys, with a blow dryer, right? Um, that's because heat will dry things a lot faster. Um, it's the fastest way to change liquid to a vapor. Um, to dry anything, your vapor pressure must change. So there's vapor pressure on walls, there's vapor pressure on floors, there's vapor pressure in the air. So when you're trying to dry... Go ahead, take that. <laughs> uh, when you're trying to dry walls, you want the vapor pressure of the wall to be higher than that of the air. So you want the vapor to be pushing out into the air. When you're high humidity in your room, what's happening is your vapor pressure in the room is higher than that of the wall and it's pushing moisture into the wall. So there's two ways you can manip manipulate your vapor pressure, is you can increase the temperature of the wet material, which will cause the vapor pressure to rise, and you can decrease the grains per pound in the room. So a combination of both of those factors is gonna be your best method for actually drying out a wall or wood or anything else. It'll create a vapor pressure differential. So how do we generate heat? How many have had heaters in your apartments after a loss? Anybody? Fires? Nope. Okay. So there's this one, which is called the direct fired heater. You should never allow any of these inside your buildings ever. They're usually propane fired. They do generate an enormous amount of heat, but they also generate an enormous amount of water. So much like when you're trying to dry a building and you walk by and somebody's, for instance, new drywall on a building when you're building it in the wintertime and the windows are soaking wet because the humidity in the building is so high, this will do the exact same thing. An indirect fired heater, these are very effective. 
Um, a lot of bricklayers will use these outside, but we use them to dry inside buildings as well. Um, all the moisture goes up through the chimney and stays outside. The hot air gets piped inside the building, so it will raise the temperature of your building drastically, and it will also help dry your building out. Hydronic heating, um, these are not really new, but probably the newest one on the block. Um, what they use is a glycol-based product, and there's a burner inside of it, like a boiler. It'll heat up the glycol. It gets sent through the, or the red and blue hoses into a heat exchanger inside the building, and then there's an air mover inside that heat exchanger that'll blow warm, dry air inside the building. Electric heating uh, usually works great. Unfortunately, most buildings do not have the power to generate these. So this is a uh, 512 BTU unit, 512,000 BTU unit. So it's very, very, a lot of heat come off, com will come off of it. But it also takes 190 amps. Most buildings aren't going to have 190 spare amps kicking around to dry this heater. Not if you want anything else to operate in your building. Um, went over vapor pressure differential a little bit. Um, so this is basically a really simple image of what vapor pressure differential is. We've all done this as kids waiting for a school bus or you're trying to dry your hair in the morning and, or your wife's trying, you know, taking a shower that's one million degrees and you're trying to see in the mirror. This is what you do. You take a hair dryer and you dry the mirror out. Drying a wall is exactly the same way. Different technology, different air movers, different dehumidifiers, but you're basically doing the exact same thing as they're doing right here. And the wall won't dry quite as fast. So here's a couple difficult drying jobs that I just want to go over that we've done. So this is a gymnasium floor that we dried out. Um, you can see the top of the floor. So a high school gym floor, just to touch base on it for you, give you an example, or um, is somewhere in the neighborhood of about a quarter of a million dollars for a high school gymnasium floor. So that's what it's made out of. So the top layer is three quarter inch maple. There's two layers of five eighths subfloor underneath of it. And then there's a quarter inch spacer block. So drying two inches of solid wood after you've had that much water on it, not the easiest task to do. Not impossible, but not the easiest task to do. That was what it looked like eight days later. So it was already cupped when we got there. And eight days later after we were able to dry it, it was happy. School board was happy, adjuster was happy. This is an example of, I don't, that's, this isn't me who did this. Um, this is a picture I found on the internet. But if you look carefully at it, so the, the hoses coming in, I'm assuming are a desk and dehumidifier. So they got a great big, very expensive dehumidifier there. You can see some of the axial air movers kicking around. But what are they drying? Everything's gone. Everything's torn out. You're not drying anything. You have steel studs and concrete and bare floor. Yet right here, you're probably, there's a dozen air movers in there. So the restoration company is billing the insurance company or the property manager, owner, somewhere in the neighborhood of about $600, $700 a day, plus the cost of the desk and dehumidifier, to dry nothing. So that's what you don't do. That, if you see that in your buildings, you want to pull your project manager aside and go, what are you doing? And that comes down to your uh, loss ratios, stuff like that. And adjusters don't know either. I mean, adjuster's job is to adjust a claim. They're not drying experts. So they may not know. Or if they have a relationship with said contractor or something along those lines, they just, OK, you're drying the building out. We don't know. But you should know that. I mean, this is going to affect your loss ratios. This is going to inflate the cost of your claims and it's going to make your, your premiums go up for no reason whatsoever. Communication, as you had touched on earlier, is probably the most important thing on a fire or any kind of claim. Um, you shouldn't have to chase your contractor down. During the emergency services, you should be getting daily update emails, including Saturday and Sunday. You should get up in the morning, and be able to read an email, and know exactly what's happening with your building. When we do a loss for a property manager slash building owner, one of the bigger ones in Canada, there's usually nine to 12 people on my email string that I send out daily. Tells them, it's not you know, a novel by any stretch of the imagination, it's just a quick little point form email, this is what's happening with your claim, this is where we are, this is what's gonna happen tomorrow. So they know. Your job costs. So your emergency costs are usually done on a time and material basis. Very rarely are they quoted because it all depends how long the job's gonna take to dry. Right? I mean, it may take three days to dry, it may take six days to dry. So to put a hard number to that, you know, if 
we're going to err. If we're going to be forced to put a hard number on it, we're going to err in our favor, not in the insurance company's favor or your favor. I mean, we're not here to lose money either. Repairs, on the other hand, that should be a quoted job. They're not usually done on a time and material basis. They're quoted repairs. And your price should stay within the quoted allotment for all known damages. Occasionally, you're going to run into unknown damages that you see something that was missed in the scope of repairs. That would be an additional. But I mean, if I quoted you $1,000 to paint this room, and then I came back after I painted it going, actually cost me 1500 Tough. You quoted me 1000 bucks. That's what you get paid to do it, right? Um, at the completion of the emergency services, you should be given all paperwork, all documentation that comes with that. So your drying records, um, your testing sheets. So if you have uh, asbestos testing or asbestos remediation that was done, you need those records. So you want your test to show that there is asbestos in the building and you want your test to show that the clearance is done and it's been done properly. These should be given to you. So again, if you ever get called in front of the Landlord-Tenant Act or what have you, you have proof that it was done properly. And don't let restoration companies do their own um, testing. They can do sampling, but don't let them test it. You want the test done at a lab. You want it done at arm's length because it can tend to be seen as improper if I look at it going, oh, that's yeah, fine. Well, who's checking my work, right? So here's a quick job review. Um, so I'll give you a few facts about this job. Um, so in this house, it was a house in um, sort of central, central Ontario. Uh, there was about 14 inches of standing water in the basement. The restoration company attended within three to five days of the loss. So if something's been wet for that long, you're not saving it. You can't dry it at that point, it's too long, it's been wet too long, we have to tear it out. They removed all the finishes on the walls, left the ceilings only. So what they did is they cut the, about that far from the ceiling, so we still had a spot that you could tape to, and cut all the draw walls out. Um, the wall framing was steel studs, so there wasn't wood. They had equipment upstairs for one week, which was five air movers and two extra large dehumidifiers to control humidity and secondary damage, which isn't all that unheard of. You do want to control secondary damage. And then in the basement, they had it in there for three weeks, which is 21 air movers and six extra large dehumidifiers, which is insane. That is just, that's taking advantage of the situation. I mean, six extra large dehumidifiers will dry pretty much this half. If you were to take this building and go across the hallway all the way, then six dehumidifiers will probably dry that. So to put eight of them in one house is just unheard of. And three weeks is insane, especially when you're already drying it out. So there's a picture of the house. So you can see there's a lot of water in the house. That's a quick floor plan of what it looks like. So it is a fairly big house. There's about 1,800 cubic feet in, or square feet in the basement. So this isn't going to mean a lot to everybody, but these are the moisture records that are taken when we go in there. So we are given a mandate to drop humidity in a building after a flood to below 60% relative humidity within 24 hours. That is what we have to do. Otherwise, you're not drying effectively. So if you look at this real close in the living room, when they got there, RH is the uh, handwritten title. And then the relative humidity is the middle column under the handwritten title, it says living room. So on the day they got there, it was 74. Two days later, it was 72. Another day was 69, 69, 65. So it took them 10 days to drop that humidity below 60%. So for 10 days, there's secondary damage going on in this building. This is a prime example of a company that does not know how to dry. Right? They're causing all kinds of additional damage when it comes like that. So that's my course. Anybody have any questions? It, it can, depending on what you're doing. Like a, a hardwood floor is a perfect example. Yeah, if you over dry it, it will actually shrink the hardwood floor and it'll start to crack the finish. So you really have to monitor it. So that gym floor that I was showing you pictures on, I had guys twice a day monitoring the entire gym floor and we were manipulating equipment and the indoor air environment to make sure that it would dry properly without over drying it. Go ahead. It reduces, for sure. So every building has mold in it. It's just a known thing. The pretty much the only room that does not have mold in it is an operating room. 
and it's because it has numerous air changes an hour. Everybody else has mold in their house at some point or another. New houses, old houses, doesn't matter. Um, you'll hear a lot of people tell you that it has to be dry within three days. That is not true. I mean, that's become an industry standard because another restoration company in the United States made a promise to an insurance company 15 years ago that they won't bill any more than three days. And somehow that's been taken as gospel and you can dry it in three days. So we did an apartment building flood in Guelph that took me six days to dry. And we had a hygienist come in to test. There wasn't a drop of mold in it. Mold can grow, you're right, within 24 to 48 hours, but it has to be in an ideal condition. Mold needs four things. It needs water, needs temperature, needs time, and it needs food source. Those are the four things it needs. It likes stagnant air. It does not like rapid moving air. So if you have an air mover that's pumping 3,000 cubic feet of air across it, it's not gonna be all that effective in growing there because it's not, you have rapid velocity air movement. So it can grow. Our rule of thumb typically is if we don't dry it within about six to seven days on a commercial loss, at that point we look at, okay, you gotta take it out because I can't guarantee there's not mold growing behind the wall on that, but it's a good question. What's that window of time before you activate your equipment? Like obviously, you know, five minutes would be great, but if it's, if it's longer than a day or two days? Within 24 hours usually. If we can't get in usually within the first 24 hours, then you've, you've lost a very big window to try and dry. I mean. It, in that circumstance, I mean, we'll talk to the building owner and say, you know, it should be removed at this point, but, you know, they may say, well, can you try and dry it? And we'll try and aggressively drying it and stuff like that to see if we can get it dry within the still the same allotment of time. But sometimes it doesn't happen. So, I mean, it's, it's a risk that you take at that point, but to try and dry it, to come in effectively after two days of something being wet saying, well, I can dry this you're not doing your job and you're doing a disservice to everybody because you're not going to be effective at drying it and you're going to bill for all the equipment that you've put in ahead of time which is just going to inflate, inflate your claim costs. So, Anybody else have any questions? Just one more thing, you're talking yep. about communication and mm -hmm. client. Most of our stuff is on the other side of the country when we get that yep. call at 3 in the morning. Yep. Um, do you guys use video? Can you upload stuff? Like a picture is worth a thousand words. Yep. It's like, you know, 40 days of rain type of flood. They're describing it to me. And when the restoration company goes in and the guy goes, it was a toilet, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, so a photograph of you guys or somewhere you could upload a video when you do your initial assessment to help us. We use a, um, a reporting software that will actually send you a preliminary report, usually within 12 hours of the loss that has all the photos, um, if videos are required of something that, it, it will do videos as well. Um, and it, it's, it's advantageous for you because you get to see everything that's going on. Sometimes videos aren't necessarily done or you take photos that are very bad. A lot of times you'll have people take a photo of water damage for this room and it'll be a picture of that. Right? Like, I mean, it's, it's not showing you the full damage. You need multiple pictures of this room showing around. So this room, if, we were, if it was vacant like this, you'd probably get 10 pictures of this room showing you the damage. And the other one you can use is infrared cameras. So we'll, we'll upload infrared images at times as well, and you can see clearly defined in the picture what's wet, what's not wet when you use infrared. So that's uh, one of the other really good technologies out there is infrared cameras. So, go ahead. In the example <coughs> you showed with the house and the standing water in the basement for three or four days before there was a contractor called in. That one? Uh, how long can you let standing water be in contact with building materials and still be able to salvage the building? Less than 24 hours. Has to be less than 24, less than 24 hours. Drywall will actually dry, and a lot of things people will tell you as well, that once drywall gets wet, it loses its structural integrity, which isn't true. I mean, we've all seen arches in drywall. You go through an arch drywall, stuff like that. The only way the contractor is getting that arch to bend is they're getting that drywall wet. So drywall most times will dry somewhere around 20 to 21% harder after it's been wet and dried properly than it was prior to that. So you can dry drywall very effectively. When it's first manufactured, it's soaking wet. Like when you watch a video of drywall being manufactured, and I mean, it comes out in a big soupy noodle, and they end up drying it, but it can be dried. It's just got to be dried properly. And how do you, how do you check out these wall cavities and that kind of stuff for uh, moisture? We have moisture meters that um, sometimes will remove the baseboard, and we have uh, insulated pin probes that you can punch through the drywall, and you can check the insulation on top of it and stuff like that as well. So insulation is a big thing. If insulation gets wet, sometimes it'll, depending on your type of insulation, it'll sag inside the wall. And at that point, you have to open up the wall because the insulation is wet. But most floods, 
like in residential settings, don't get above an inch and a half deep. So I mean, it's still above the bottom plate of the drywall or bottom plate of the framing, so you're not gonna have any moisture there. And commercial buildings, you look at apartment buildings, if it's an interior flood within the walls, there's usually not a lot of insulation. It's usually concrete block and uh, it can be dried as well, so. Any other question? What's the difference in the cost uh, of the laser cleaning uh, it's, it's similar in cost. I mean, laser is going to be probably a little faster overall. Um, but, I mean, it's done on a job-by-job -job basis. It depends. I mean, we did one here in Toronto that was on the 13th floor, 14th floor. And I had a genie boom to lift the guys up. So, I mean, in that case, you have the cost of the equipment rental to get them up there and do it, or a swing stage. Um, so it, it's really done on a job-by-job -job basis, but it's comparable to traditional cleaning methods. It just works exponentially better. So mold removal is another thing. I mean, there's better methods of removing mold in attics and stuff like that now. We, have, we can chemically treat mold within hours. So you walk in or you have a buying a house or something like that and the attic's all covered in mold. We have uh, technology where our guys can go in and actually remove all the mold from the attic in hours. You can watch it change in front of you, it happens so fast. It's extremely caustic when they're doing that. It's a very heavily bleached place product that does that, and the guys wear a lot of personal protective equipment to do it, but it works fantastic. So I've never had a hygienist come in after that and go, okay. The only other way you can clean mold off an attic is to remove the uh, sheeting, or you scrub it, and then by scrubbing it, you're putting your employees at risk because you have a million nails coming through holding the shingles up, right? So they're scrubbing it, and it can hit their gloves or whatever and cut them. So this way they just spray it on. It works great. Who are the best people to call in for the testing? You mentioned the hygienist a couple of times. Yep. Um, we've gone to traditional, you know, the pensions of the world. They're frightfully expensive, incredibly slow. No disrespect to pensions, but <laughs> do you have a, do you use a different resource? So what we do is, and if there's any hygienists in here, I apologize. Um, we'll sample ourselves and we send it to a lab. So we can typically get you asbestos results or mold results within 24 hours in most cases. What you're paying for a lot of the times when you get um, a, um, a test done by a lab or by a hygienist is you're paying for the reporting that comes along with it. And I've had this conversation with numerous of them. I'm friends with a lot of them and I'm like, nobody cares where asbestos comes from. We don't, we just wanna know yes or no. That's all I care about. Right, but they refuse to do it. They want to give you the whole report on everything else as to what's going on. So, I mean, there, there's times and places where you need that reporting, but when we're here to tear out a little bit of drywall, A, I can't wait for a week because I'll lose my window to dry it and you're gonna risk mold growing. So we'll end up cutting it out ourselves. Our guys are trained on how to take sampling and they have asbestos awareness. We actually have in-house asbestos crews, so they know exactly what to look for. We'll take the samples, we'll drop it off at a lab and ask for 24 hour or same day results depending on the urgency, and we'll get the results and say, yeah, okay, it contains or no, it doesn't. If it is as big asbestos job, protocols are then written by a hygienist. So we'll take the results and then call in a hygienist and go, you know, the drywall plaster is, um, as best as containing, I need you to give me protocols for what has to happen. So they're definitely needed on jobs, but you're right to just do a simple test on drywall or plaster to find out if it is containing mold can be prohibitively expensive for that. Quiet room. Well, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Um, hopefully you uh, walk away with a little bit of information and uh, you learned something. So.